Hello everyone, this is Charles here from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today on Tube Lab number 91, we're going to be trying out a new video format. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them and always consult a professional technician when in doubt. So, first things first, I'm not Jim. Well, for any of you who haven't seen The Last Tube Lab, I'm his son Charles. I recently came on board to help full time with valves and more, Mellotone kits, and of course, Tube Lab. Expect to see more of me on the channel in the future. So one of the things that's intrigued me since I've started working with tubes is the detailed and complex history of the people and companies that made them, as well as the differences in construction and design across the years and versions. So in what I'm calling tube history, I'm going to take you along for the ride as I explore this rich and detailed history. We welcome your feedback in the comments. So, on to the first episode. We're going to look at something we've talked about briefly before. The long obsolete and nearly forgotten tube base known as a Loctal. Let's start with the basics. Well, actually, let's start by taking a look at these beautiful boxes. So I'm going to bring that up to the camera here. I just absolutely love these old boxes. There's a great looking CBS Hytron. And you've got to remember most of these boxes are close to 80 years old at this point so they look absolutely incredible. Let's take the tubes out here. Okay, so each of these three tubes is a Loctal, and they're actually all of the same type. So, the basics of a Loctal. Physically, Loctal tubes have the following features. They have an all-glass tube with a pressed-on aluminum base and short, thin pins protruding from the bottom of the glass. The aluminum base also has a notch around it that allows it to lock into an appropriate base. And there's a bump on the outside that tells you which way you need to rock the tube to release this locking mechanism. So let's take, take a really good look at these tubes here. Let me see if I can get them properly in focus. Here is a Square plate tall boy. Sorry, the chrome is really making it hard to get this thing in focus so you can see it. There, how's that? That's not too bad. Huge amounts of chrome on these guys. Here's a short angled T plate, Raytheon branded. Lots of gettering on them. They look really nice. And here's the CBS Hytron. This one is a short T-plate. Again, sorry, having trouble getting these in focus here. Most of the labels still on this. That's one downside with these Loctal tubes is that a lot of the labeling, since they were mostly rebrands, um, just it's that very, very light coating of paint in it. And you just look at it the wrong way and it comes off. But this one has a, another neat little label on here. Apparently these tubes were either sold or given away maybe as part of some sort of promotional program. And I thought that was neat to have on here. I'm not going to take it off. So, what else distinguishes Loctal tubes? Well, 
I mean, of course, there's the locking mechanism. It's in the name. Uh, but they're also known for being uh, overbuilt. They were often made for high vibration and rough handling, leading to many having the strong gettering, uh, extra mica spacers or metal whiskers, and support posts that are reminiscent and, in some cases, identical to their military spec orbital cousins. So where did these tubes come from? Who made them? And why? Well, to answer those questions, we have to go all the way back to the 1930s, when we saw an explosion in tube development driven by the need for high-frequency amplification. Before the introduction of modern octal bases in 1935 by RCA and General Electric, the standardization of tube sockets and the construction of the tubes themselves was going through a revolution. So let's clear these off here. And get that around the right way. Okay. So, you can see these are some of the common bases of the time. Here we've got the UX4, the UX5, the B5, and this is a B7, and this is an acorn base. So one of the things that you'll notice about all these designs is that they don't have center posts on them, or regular pin sizing and spacing. For example, the UX4 has two pins that are larger than the two other pins, and that is how you know which way you're supposed to put it in the socket. The UX5, the B5, and the B7 have odd pin arrangements, meaning that they can only fit into the socket one way. But these kinds of configurations made them harder to manufacture and also limited the number of pins that you could have coming out of the base. This is an acorn socket, and this is actually something that RCA came up with for transmitting tubes. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit more here on it. There we go. And this one actually has the pins coming out radially out of the glass. It's an interesting design. Um, I think it's probably not difficult to see why it didn't take off. But it was an attempt to solve the issue of having reliable high frequency transmitting tubes. So, we had these sockets and many, many others floating around as everybody was trying to come up with new standards and a better way of doing things especially whenever it came to high frequency, high voltage, and keeping signals on grids protected from those voltages. The other issue with having the uh, limited number of pins from these bases is that you couldn't have more than one set of components per tube without making some form of compromise. That compromise could have been having uh, contacts coming out as top or side caps. It could have been having, uh, say if you had a dual tryout, it could have been having both the tryouts running in parallel or series, internal to the tube. And since these uh, dual, um, dual component tubes were becoming much more popular and necessary in some cases, they were, everybody was trying to come up with a new base design to support them. And at the same time, they were trying to come up with a new base design for supporting high frequency usage. At the time as well, most tubes were built using an all metal cap, which used a lot more material. And many manufacturers were working on trying to create an all glass design without any top or side caps so that it would be stronger and more reliable and cheaper to produce. So let's get this out of the way here. Enter the Phillips Research and Development Group, who in 1939, oh, I'm sorry, 1938, attended the International Television Conference in Zurich. During their presentation, they showed photographs of their brand new, excuse me, EE50 valve, 
The EE50 introduced a host of innovations. Some were inspired by other companies, such as the regular pin spacing, as you can see here, and general footprint from the octal socket, and having all the pins protruding from one end of the envelope, which was a recent Telefunken innovation. The introduction of an all-glass envelope without extra leads and a locking base with thin lead wires were a Philips innovation. These made the EE50 less material dependent than the preceding all-metal valves. The short pins allowed it to work at higher frequencies with less interference and the base made it easier to design and uh, sorry to design around since top or side cap connections were no longer needed. It did have some issues though. The first big issue, well I guess the only big issue with this, were these bent pins. So why did they bend the pins? Well, the other thing you might notice here is that the central spigot here is smooth. So why does this tube have that sort of divot, whatever you'd like to call it. Well, these first tubes locked in to their base by twisting. You would push it in and then rotate a very small amount and that would lock these into their contacts. Unfortunately, Phillips found that these would end up breaking the glass fairly often, especially if you applied too much force in the rotation. So to fix this, they came up with the EF50 as a successor. The EF50 replaced the bent pins with straight ones and moved the locking mechanism to the central spigot in combination with the socket. This simplified the sockets and also made it less likely that these pins would break the glass. The EF50 was a remote cutoff pentode and it was absolutely vital to British radar during the Second World War. And so now we find ourselves with something that looks quite a bit like what would become the Sylvania Loctal, though it has nine pins instead of eight. Okay, I have some other print offs here from an internal article that somebody was nice enough to translate online. This is from Philips, and it shows some of the internal construction characteristics. Let me see if I can get these in focus here of the EF50. And interestingly, here is a picture of an EF50 without a central locking divot on the central pin. And if you'd like to read this article, it explains why that exists. And the original idea was that they would have, let me turn this back around here, they would have sockets that had locking mechanisms in them and sockets that didn't have locking mechanisms in them. So you could have ones for high vibration usage and you could have ones where you could just pull the tube straight out without any issues, just like an octal. And I really feel like if they had gone in that direction originally, or at least if Sylvania had, they would have ended up with a more successful tube because the socket was the weak point. It also shows why they ended up going with an even pin spacing rather than having them come through a pinch design. The force would be spread equally on the glass and it would be less likely to break. This is a really neat article. I'm going to link to this in the, um, in the description, but it, it goes into extreme detail about how all the features of the EF50 were fixing the current problems of the time, such as having leads that were too long for high frequency use. And here's an example of the locking mechanism being shown in detail. So this is really neat to look over. Okay, so 
This is where I'm going to end this episode. Next episode, we're going to take a look at the Sylvania design and its competition with the then brand new Octal base. If you're interested in reading more of this history, I've included links to my sources in the description, including an excellent write-up by Donald Decker titled The EF-50, The Tube That Helped to Win the War. Okay, so what else is going on? Let's see here. So, it's been a busy week here for us at Valves and More. Um, lots of tubes have been coming in, we've been getting lots tested, and with the popularity of our shit Freya sets and your requests, we've decided to start offering sets for other shit amplifiers. We're going to be starting with the Folkvanga, I really hope I'm pronouncing that right, and it uses eight of these 6N 6P dual triodes. Look at that. They're beautiful looking tubes, nice tall boy nine pins. And these have very high heater current, high power output, and low internal resistance. So these are great for being used with output transformerless amplifiers, which is what the uh, Folkvanger is. It's being driven by a 6N1P output dual triode. And there are actually a bunch of different tubes that could be put in place of this, such as the 6922, the ECC88, and some other similar types. The other amplifier we're going to be releasing for is the Valhalla, which uses these same tubes, but instead of using eight of the 6N6P, it only uses two. So it's a little more reasonable. I mean, eight of these, wow. Okay. The other thing is that since this driver can be any number of different types, we're not going to put every one of them in the sets. It's just going to make it very complicated and hard to look through. So if you'd like to try something special or different that should be compatible with these amplifiers, just send us a message and we'd, uh, we'd be happy to help you pick out something other than the 6N1P. And of course, once they're in the store and if you purchase them, please leave a review about how they sound. Uh, it's great because it helps us understand better how these tubes sound in different systems. And of course it's going to help other buyers make choices that will get them just the sound they are looking for. Alright. Now, actually let's bring the 6N6P back in here for a second to talk about this a little bit more. I've already passed all of these tubes through uh, a GM tester just to weed out any of the bad ones. And we, we have several cases of them, and out of quite a few tubes, we've only had a couple tests bad. They're, they're very nice. But testing for GM or mutual conductance is not what you want to do with a power tube. With a power tube, you want to test for the current emissions or milliamps that it's able to put out at its idle state. And that is how you want to match them. So, uh, some of you may know that Jim has a custom-built power tube tester, and we use that for tubes such as the EL34, the KT88, the 6550C, uh, the GU50. Um, it's fantastic because we can test these tubes at their correct operating voltages and operating point and we can measure the actual current that they're putting out. Unfortunately, we don't have a nine pin socket on it yet. So what I'm gonna be doing, and I'm gonna put this aside here. And bring this in. This is a B&K 700 tube tester. It's 
Here, let me zoom out a little bit. Still can't get it all in frame, but you know, it's a big tester. So the B&K 700 and 707 are great testers. They have a section up here that you can just see the edge of. That's called Jet Test Section. And it allows you to very quickly test large numbers of tubes because you don't have to set anything on here other than the heater and the sensitivity. The bottom section has switches for defining which pins connect where and sockets that are wired up in different ways. It is great because it tests for emissions. The problem is that we have this meter to, con to contend with and it only goes from 0 to 120 and gives us a general value of if a tube is good, if it's on the edge, or if it's bad. Technically, we could match tubes this way. We could get a number off of this meter and use that to current match. But the standard is to actually get the correct milliamp value for the tubes. So this coming week, I'm going to be modifying this tester right here so that it has two jacks that allow me to plug in a multimeter. And then we'll be able to get an actual current measurement for these tubes in their idle state. And that will allow us to match them correctly for you. So that's going to be a neat job for me. Okay, so let's see what else has come in here. All right, let's get these in frame. So first of all, I'm sure many of you recognize this. We've been able to get in another shipment of the Melts MELZ 6SN7 metal base. And here I'm going to give you a nice close in, in focus view of the tube. We keep hearing from people that they want to see more nice shots of these tubes. Yeah, take a look at that. It's really nice looking. It's great straight T plates. This mica spacers. Really nice. So there are already, as soon as this video goes up, there are three matched pairs in the store and they're going to go quick. So you better hurry up if you want them. Let's put that one aside here. Now what are these? If you aren't a guitarist and if you don't own an old Ampeg amp, you probably never heard of this tube. This is the 6BK11, and it's a Compactron. Now, what's a Compactron? Well, Compactrons came very, very late to the tube game, and they were made in a response to transistors, early transistors taking the market share. The idea being that it would combine multiple tubes into one, and you'd end up with something that's more compact, hence Compactron, and more power efficient since they would be saving uh, power from having a shared heater. This particular tube is actually a 12AX7 with one half of a 12AT7 inside of it. And Ampeg in the 1960s used these tubes as preamps in their jet line of guitar amplifiers. The problem is, is that these were very, very low production, and it's almost impossible to find them used and new today. If you look online, you're going to find forums full of people asking where they can find these, or if there is a possible replacement. There are some similar tubes, but they don't perform the same. We were lucky enough to find three of these recently in a tube purchase. Two of them are a new old stock in these unmarked boxes, and one was loose, which we believe was new old stock. It's testing well, but it doesn't come with the original box. So these are going to be up in the store. Um, they're not up there right now, but they will be up very soon. So if you have an old Ampeg Jet guitar amp and you're looking to revive it with some new tubes, there you go. They're going to be at the ready. All right.
So if you stay till the end, then here's some great coupon codes that you can use in the store. Remember, we've got flat rate shipping for $20 around the world. And if your order is over $150 after discount, the shipping is on us. That's all for today. This is Charles from Valves and More signing off. See you next week.